I V M. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. Hello, and welcome to The Wire Talks. I'm Siddharth Bhatia. There's an upsurge in violence against minorities, especially Muslims, in different parts of India. Much of it is happening in states ruled by the BJP, where the police and the state administration remain mute spectators. In Jangirpuri, in Delhi, a procession to celebrate Ram Navmi had menacing overtones with the participants wielding revolvers and swords as they passed near a mosque shouting provocative slogans loudly. The police in Delhi is controlled by the Union Home Ministry. Is there a pattern to this and what does this sudden burst of incidents signify? We'll try to understand that with our guest today, Professor Ashutosh Varshni, who is now in Brown University and has studied India for decades. He's written several books on this subject and, you know, he's a familiar name in India since he publishes in local newspapers. Ashutosh Varshni, academic and author of books such as Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life, Hindus and Muslims in India, and Battles Half Won, India's Improbable Democracy. And that was true at one time, but it's more more improbable and less democracy at the moment. Winner of several academic awards, Professor Varshni, teaches social sciences and political science at Brown University, where he also directs the Center for Contemporary South Asia. Previously, he taught at Harvard and the University of Michigan and Arbor. Welcome to the Wire Talks, Ashutosh Varshni. Pleasure to be here talking to you. To begin with, how do you see the rise in communal violence and the kinds of violence that is being perpetrated in different parts of India. These are not outbreaks of the old kind when two communities clashed and the police intervened. Uh, Sometimes it came down heavily on one community. Sometimes it was a little neutral. These are different, wouldn't you say? That's exactly right. I studied communal riots for over 10 years in the 1990s and published a book in 2002, Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life, which you mentioned, Hindus and Muslims in India, both here um, in England and India and Pakistan, in four countries that book was published. And uh, one important part of that book was entirely statistical. So with Stephen Wilkinson, who now teaches at Yale, created the first data set of all reported Hindu-Muslim rights in India from 1950 to 1995. That data set has become the foundation for a lot of statistical work later. It's almost always used. So on the basis of those 1180 riotous incidents in the data set from 1950 to 1995, in which at least 7,000 Uh, 173 people were killed. This, And I can explain to you why at least is a very important qualification here. Why exact numbers are virtually impossible. I think impossible. But so at least is one way to get some traction on this problem. It is true that in several riots, there were doubts about the neutrality of the state, how the police intervene, perhaps sometimes more on on one side and sometimes on the other. But generally speaking, the big difference between riots then, with two exceptions, Delhi 1984 and Gujarat 2002, with the general rule or the generalization one can derive from 1950 to 1994, 1995 period is that the state did not openly abandon the principle of neutrality vis-a-vis religious groups. There may have been doubts about whether it sided 
with one community or the other, but did not openly abandon. With the exception of Delhi 84 and Gujarat 2002, we have reached a point in India's history now that the state in BJP rule state is openly abandoning the principle of neutrality vis-a-vis religious groups. And in some cases, a mute spectator, as you put it, in some cases, a very open participant in anti-Muslim violence. That is the big difference. Now, conceptually, and this is the last point I want to make in response to your first question, conceptually, there is a difference between riots and pogroms. Pogroms are a special category of riots when the state abandons its principle of neutrality. India has mostly had riots uh, so far. India might be entering a period of pogroms now where the state is not neutral and is openly abandoning abandoning the principle of neutrality. As I said, there have been two clear pogroms in India, Delhi 84 and Gujarat 2002. But other than that, the principle of neutrality was not abandoned. One of the things we've all observed, many of us have observed, I certainly have been writing on this, is that it's not merely the police looking on or participating or abandoning neutrality, but it is the other arms of the state. For example, the state administration then turns around and says in Karnataka, oh no, hijab you'll have to wear, or stops, comes up with a rule which says that you know, Muslims cannot sell in shops close to temples or something like that. So you see that it may not be, I seriously doubt, but suppose it is coincidental. Suppose they have invoked a law. It just comes in, it's a form of pressure, if not violence, classical violence, where they go after this community and say, oh, while you're being beaten up, we are taking away your economic rights. So it's on many fronts. And that, I think, I don't remember seeing at all. For example, even in uh, Punjab, even in Delhi, the central government did not turn around and say, oh, we are going to have a law to say Sardars cannot sell their wares in cannot place or something like that. So is this a huge change? That is fundamentally correct also. In Delhi, um, in 1984, I was actually physically present uh, there. The attack was clearly state-supported, but it was the state did not come up with a law which says, for example, that Sikhs would not be allowed to drive taxis or Sikhs would not be allowed to sell flowers or mithai near Hindu temples or or they would not. Even more important, if you want to look at the, the hijab controversy uh, comparatively, even more important is is the turban that Sikhs wear. In France, for example, in government spaces and often in uh, designated public spaces, no religious, no religious wear is allowed. So the Christians can't have the cross hanging around their, their, the Jews cannot have uh, David stars. And um, uh, similarly, Muslims can't wear uh, the head covering, the hijab. Uh, But that's not what Karnataka government did, and this will spread. I don't think it will remain uh, uh, confined to Karnataka. Karnataka government basically said that that hijab will not be allowed for uh, Muslim girls will not be allowed to wear headgear or hijab uh, when they go to school. That is that has never been done before, and and elsewhere in the world also, religious gear. A religious wear is not uh, is not selectively outlawed. It is not, and what's happening now, as you rightly put it, is a is an entirely novel development and a dangerous one. If 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 hijab is disallowed, why aren't turbans disallowed? So even even in or why is wearing a tilak not allow, not disallowed for for Hindu boys? Um, or wearing a dhoti, uh, not allowed for Hindu boys. In some parts of India, boys come to school wearing a dhoti, not wearing pants. Hmm? And certainly wearing a tilak in several parts of India. I've seen that myself. So this is also not simply how the police behaves in BJP-controlled states, but the way the executive wing or the legislature 
not simply the police, the way the executive wing of the government and the legislature, state legislatures are functioning also shows a great deal, uh, also shows an abandonment of the principle of neutrality, which is central to India's constitution. India's constitution talks about religious neutrality of the state as well as religious equality of citizens. And both principles are violated in practices in the executive decrees you mentioned and in the legislation that is being passed in, in several assemblies. Assemblies dominated by the BJP especially. So I'm going to ask a very obvious question, uh, Ashutosh. And that is, why do you think that this is happening? Why is the state being so obvious and brazen about it? We know the answer, but I'd like you to give some kind of context to it. And why do you think the it's happening only in BJP states? But fundamentally, why is it happening? So Hindu nationalism, right since its origin, has identified some communities as anti-national, a term was anti-Indian. And earlier, now, now the term is anti-national, uh, some minorities in particular. Minorities that do not have, that might be born in India, but their sacred places are not in India. And the two communities which are substantial in India, which qualify, are Muslims, of course, 14% of India, and Christians, a little over 2% of India. Their sacred uh, places are or more, most sacred places, their, uh, the term was in Savarkar's language, Punnibhumi. Their Punnibhumi, their sacred uh, lands are in the Middle East or in the Vatican. And so the claim was that unlike Hindus whose sacred lands are here, unlike Sikhs whose sacred lands are here, unlike Buddhists whose sacred lands are here, Muslims and Christians and Jews also, but Jews were so were in such small numbers that the argument didn't have any uh, political muscle or statistical muscle, that Christians and Muslims are not true Indians. Now, the next step in the evolution of this idea was the, it's the response of Hindu nationalism, uh, which believes that India is a Hindu nation and Hindus ought to have primacy and non-Hindu groups cannot be given equality. They have to be secondary citizens. The next step in the evolution of this idea was how was the constitution of India. And Hindu nationalists were completely opposed to the to Ambedkar's claim that India had to be not only equal to all castes, but India, Indian polity and Indian laws had to be equal with respect to religious communities also. The idea of religious equality of in citizenry and the idea of religious neutrality of the state, the RSS, which is the ideological, the mother organization, uh, was opposed to, they did not accept the constitution of India. The Hindu nationalists electorally were not very significant until the 1990s. They were in a couple of states, basically, but after the Ayodhya movement, their national rise began, and they came to power in a coalition during 1998 and 2004, but that was in a coalition. In 2004, they came to power without a coalition, though they maintained the coalition formally, but their own numbers crossed the majority in parliament. And 2019, that majority became, BJP's majority became bigger. So now we have a party which believes in an ideology which is unconstitutional. It's an unconstitutional ideology. However, that party is getting electoral majorities or parliamentary or legislative majorities and winning elections on the basis of Hindu nationalist claim. So its, it's ideological trajectory, though it's coming in conflict with India's basic constitutional laws and norms, is beginning to attack what Indian democracy stood for. It's the electoral victory of the BJP, which is causing this constitutional difficulty, and it will, it might soon become a constitutional crisis, depending on what the courts say about so many of these legislations. So, 
actually that's a very good summing up because you've given a lot of uh, context going back to Savarkar and the founding of the RSS and its uh, core belief. In fact, we should say that it's not only core belief and the fact is all the chief ministers, to say nothing of the prime minister and the home minister himself, themselves are hardcore RSS people. So they are steeped. It's in their DNA. So they will do it. Except that is what I was leading to after before I when I asked the previous question. We live in a highly interdependent world today. And if you keep doing this, you know you're sitting in uh, the United States. You know that several organizations and media in the United States elsewhere have been criticizing. Politicians have criticized. Academics have criticized. Various uh, NGOs have been shut down here. They have criticized. So, is it... And celebrities also. Celebrities, of course, of course. But the celebrities, as you know, who are billionaires, are being paid to tweet. So, (laughs) this is one of the narratives that one keeps hearing. So, if that is the case, isn't there some sense that we have to bank on the Muslim countries or rather Middle Eastern countries who are providing us employment as well as oil, and we trade with them. And so also so many other countries. So despite that, these chief ministers and the prime minister keeps quiet. What what can be the logic when you think of that? I think the logic is uh, the following. They believe that they are in a, an international context today or uh, uh, a point in the evolution of of world politics today that the persecution of Muslims in India will not lead to powerful countries in the world um, uh, criticizing India uh, to such an extent or dropping India from their international interactions entirely primarily because India is needed for several other international projects, for example, containing China. Hmm? And containment of China in Asia or in the so-called new terminology, Indo-Pacific, in that that project of American foreign policy uh, to which um, several powerful European countries have... um, for for which several powerful European countries have expressed support, that project of containment of China cannot easily proceed without India's participation. So the calculation appears to be that India is needed for some other foreign policy objectives of the powerful countries in the world. And therefore, persecution of Muslims will not rise to the level of significance or concern that a foreign policy objective would be uh, abandoned altogether and India's persecution of Muslims will be held against India to uh, ostracize India or to punish India. Now, um, uh, so that's the calculation. I think that's clear to me. Uh, That's what's happening. And you raised the question about the Middle Eastern countries. The Middle Eastern countries have not criticized China for the persecution of Uyghurs, right? So the Middle Eastern countries, when they criticize persecution of Muslims and when they do not criticize persecution of Muslims, might also be a strategic choice. So yes, India does a lot of business with uh, with Middle Eastern countries and India sends a lot of... uh, Indians to work in the in the in in the Middle East. It is not clear that the Middle Eastern countries are going to very heavily criticize India. They may, they may not. If they very heavily criticize, I don't know what uh, what Delhi would do. And if if United States very heavily criticize criticizes, I don't know what Delhi would do. But I think the calculation in Delhi is that India is needed for some key international foreign policy projects today and therefore the persecution of Muslims either would be ignored or might even be forgiven. I don't want to take it down. Uh, this is just a small point I'm making, but I don't want to take it down the foreign policy route uh, because uh, that's unending in itself. 
but uh, it's not as though we have contained china we have given over our land we have lost land so uh, how much uh, we have the uh, strength to resist china much less uh, offset it remains to be seen anyway that is correct yeah. so yeah. yeah so now we come to this uh, we understand the calculation we understand that it is a somewhat cynical and short term calculation there is some short termism in it short sightedness if nothing else because these things are fundamental and anyone can pull a rabbit out of a hat and criticize you heavily at some stage but why is the prime minister silent this is a question as you know has been asked continuously in this country for the last 7 8 years why is he silent the prime minister believes in this ideology the prime minister wants to wants to have a hindu nationalist india prime minister has come from the rss prime minister uh, has repeat, has um, right in the beginning when he came to power he talked about how his rise to power means that 1200 saal ki ulami khatam ho rahi hai and it's a, it's a standard rss trope if you read those books written by Golwalkar, for example, Golwalkar has has this has this claim about Bara Sau Sal ki Golami. That the concept, what is the concept of Bara Sau Sal ki Golami? The concept is that India's colonization did not begin with British capture of Bengal in 1757. India's colonization began with the Muslim capture of Sindh in 711, and certainly after the rise of Delhi Sultanate in the 11th century. right so if you believe that india's colonization began in 7 711 or in the 11th century and not in the mid 18th century then you and if you if you if you say that you clearly that statement of the prime minister which was made several times incidentally hasn't made that for for quite quite a few years now but in the beginning for at least 2 years he made that statement repeatedly including in new york hmm? Uh, where I know, and I wrote columns about two two columns about that. If you so that's the core belief of the RSS, and uh, and the second part of that belief is that Hindu primacy uh, can be established only by teaching Muslims a lesson and and pushing them into the margins by taking a revenge for for what happened between 711 or certainly between let's say 11th century and and 1757 by taking a revenge. and uh, Brit- the british are gone so that's not a revenge you have to take uh, the muslims are still here 14% of india is muslim on the hindu muslim question india was partitioned in 1947 so uh, a substantial proportion of indian muslims remained in india and now that hindu nationalism has come to power electorally it's time to establish a new political order premised upon the idea of hindu primacy or hindu supremacy that is that's why the prime minister is silent there is no other reason if if he followed what atal bihari vajpayee in 2002 called raj dharma if he followed raj dharma he would criticize this openly partisan conduct of the of the police and he would also criticize the openly partisan conduct of bjp state governments but he doesn't believe in that his beliefs are are rooted in the ideology of hindu nationalism which he thinks now he can use to establish a new political order in india even if it goes against the constitution so from his point of view is what is going on is just a question of putting the plan in operation and a few uh, heads will be broken nothing wrong if they are broken look at uh, uh, in jangirpuri when the procession came out of the blue they were waving swords they were waving revolvers they were shouting provocatively and uh, many people were arrested because naturally there was some kind of retaliation many people were were uh, arrested most muslims a few hindus and uh, the houses were bulldozed by the administration that of course was clearly done without following the legal system but legal system how does it matter it's inferior to the the ideological hindu. system yeah exactly so mm-hmm. whether people are being killed or they are being disenfranchised enfranchised as is happening in assam uh, mm-hmm. or they have been uh, jailed they 
it's all part of the project and that's a i would not even call it cynical that's a very sinister idea isn't it no that is part of the project that is in, an integral component of the project the project has long been uh, another uh, part of the ideological belief system if you read the rss text is that the muslim does not listen to the language of persuasion and dialogue the muslim only listens to the language of force and that is the truth of of muslim religion that is the truth of muslim history you read the arguments in the in golmerkel's writings and savarkar's writings uh, you read the arguments the arguments are very clear the muslim listens only to the language of force not to the language of persuasion or dialogue and that according to hindu nationalism is the truth of islam is the truth of muslim community they have used force in the past and coercion in the past to attain their objectives it is time for the hindu community to use force and coercion to attain its objectives now right so so it is part of the project there is no doubt about that we'll be right back after this short break have you ever wondered where the business world is headed how the ways in which we create market and sell to consumers will evolve or if we'll ever go back to wearing pants while working for answers to all of this and more tune into advertising is dead with me varun dugirala every tuesday as i talk to entrepreneurs leaders and change makers from across business media marketing and beyond you can catch all episodes of advertising is dead on the ibm podcast website app or wherever you get your podcast from welcome back to the wire talks it seems to also uh for the bjp work politically and electorally because they can easily point out that we went in for elections wherever that was they were needed because there is always this thing to say oh they will not have election but why shouldn't they have election give them legitimacy so they went in for two general election won them handsomely one in up twice handsomely and just before the second victory there was a lot of communal upset now gujarat is coming karnatak is there the elections in karnatak coming and um, so it it kind of starts bubbling over in good time so part of it is project driven and ideological driven but part of it also happily it works for them it didn't work in three states it didn't work in west bengal all three for different reasons it didn't work beyond a point in bihar though they had a, a coalition and it miserably didn't work in maharashtra because the other side uh, and maharashtra has its own unique history about not going for the brahmins so it didn't work and they got the rug pulled out under their feet but it just did not work in three places but in the hindi belt it just work handsomely right so that's right see the the biggest weakness of hindu nationalism historically has been its its lack of electoral power right historically that began to change in the 1990s and it fundamentally changed in in uh, after 2014 2014 elections i i have to add was not fought on the basis of hindu nationalism it was not and i i observed watched or was present at many of these speeches of mr modi no that was not fought on hindu nationalist campaign you can call it a, a subsidiary subterranean theme if you will because the rss karyakartas were going in to up's various to up towns and villages knocking on the door etc that is and and muzaffarnagar riots had taken place in in september of 2013 uh, but that was not a hindu nationalist campaign primarily that pri- primarily 2019 was definitely hindu nationalist campaign and 2017 up was a hindu nationalist campaign right the election of yogi adityanath or or the choice of yogi adityanath as a, as chief minister of up was the clearest statement by the prime minister of india that a vigilante organization or or the or the chief of a hindu vigilante organization would represent the political party called the bjp um, uh, and not only represented but will be the chief minister of the biggest state of india 
after BJP won the 2017 election. Before that, he might have been an MP, all right, but he was his basic introduction in UP was that he led a Hindu vigilante organization, led campaigns against love jihad, etc. So, so you are absolutely right to say, Siddharth, that it's the elect. Total legitimation of Hindu nationalism, which has transformed the power of Hindu nationalism. It is working for them, as you put it. It's working for them. And uh, at, at this point, 11 states of uh, India are not with them. 17 are. And these 11 states, incidentally, contain three of the largest, Maharashtra, uh, Bengal and Tamil Nadu. Hmm? Bihar is not fully with them, but Bihar, uh, you could count in their, in their, in their box, put, put, put Bihar in their box. But the biggest here is Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh is not, it's not no longer Gujarat. It's Uttar Pradesh now, which has become the new foundation of Hindu nationalist power and new foundation of Hindu nationalist. And, and Uttar Pradesh is more than three times as large as Gujarat. It changes national politics in a way that Gujarat cannot easily because of Gujarat's size. And, and if you have six, they had 73 MPs from UP in uh, 71 of their own and two of, of, of Apnadal in, in 2014, and they had 63 again in, in, in 2019. That's a very large contingent of, of MPs from one state which is the largest state of India, which is uh, uh, nearly twice as large as, as Bengal, twice as large as Tamil Nadu, more than one and a half times as large as Maharashtra. And uh, it's providing the political force, is generating the political force that uh, BJP has acquired in the last few years. So the question has to be asked when we talk of political polarization or politics or election, we have to ask, do the opposition parties, which are doing quite well in certain states by themselves, Punjab now, Bengal, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Bihar, they are in a coalition, but it's he's not their uh, party member, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, CPM. I mean, when you look at it, it's the whole political spectrum, ideological spectrum. Right. Is there any kind of organization or joint force. It has been done in the past, not once, but a couple of times. Is there any kind of force that can be formed to resist this juggernaut? So, from any sensible political perspective, that has to be called the most important strategic question in India today. And the answer takes several forms. The first is, the battle uh, against the BJP today cannot be fought by any single party. It has to be a coalition. Just as the battle against the Congress party historically could not be fought by any particular party, but it had to start as a coalition, and then BJP ran ahead of other political parties. Similarly, coalition. That's point number one. Point number two is the, that everyone understands, every political player understands that. Point number two is the more difficult issue. Who should lead that? If you think only in terms of which party has how much of India's vote, Congress party still has 19% of India's vote. In both elections, it got 19% of India's vote, 2014-2019. And no other party has more than 3, 3.5% of India's vote. TMC is probably at 3.2 or 3.3. It, it is in control of a very big state of India, an historically very important state of India, Bengal. And But it, it's, it's not more than 3.2. DMK is not more than 2.6, 2.7. Ahmadmi Party is probably less than 2%. So who should lead that coalition is the most difficult issue. Everyone understands conceptually or as a matter of political understanding that it has to be a coalitional effort. But who should lead that coalition is a very difficult issue. I don't know whether it's, it will be solved. If it will not be solved, then BJP wins again in 2024. And you really have the most propitious conditions for the establishment of Hindu uh, political order, Hindu nationalist political order, Hindu supremacy. And the constitution will in all probability come apart with a third victory. 
the electoral force of Hindu nationalism will undermine the constitutional integrity of India. I don't think there's any doubt about that if 2024 BJP wins sensibly. So who should lead the coalition is the tricky issue. Yeah, well, in the past, uh, I saw the formation. Uh, I, I was still just entering uh, the profession. I saw the formation of the Janta Party. You had uh, the Socialist and the BJP. And you had the old Congress and some breakaways from Indira Congress. So... The emergency galvanized them and they did form, though they came apart 17 months later uh, or something on those lines or 20, two mu- two, 20 months later. So it's not as if it's not done. Uh, Deva Gauda was a prime minister, so was Gujral. The thing is that yeah. none of them had the lasting power and at the moment everybody, the BJP had flexibility, it was ready to be everybody's tail. As long as it was part of it, the B, uh, Congress does not. The Congress members its heydays. So we have an issue. But, um, you know, we have a curious situation where everyone understands that if they don't hang together, they will hang separately. So anyway, what happens if the minorities react violently? Right. So that is uh, another important question you're asking, that. Let me answer that as a comparative political scientist and then turn to India. The project of the political supremacy of the majority community has been pursued in Sri Lanka, has been pursued in Malaysia. And I'm using these two in particular. I can go to, I can talk about Israel also, but Israel is is quite different. And, and Israel was founded as a Jewish state. Sri Lanka was not founded as a Sinhalese state. And Malaysia was not founded as a as a Malay state. They were not. They were both founded like India as constitutional democracies which promised religious equality or racial equality. Israel was not founded on the principle of uh, the equality of Palestinians and, and the Jews. No. So that comparison is of a different kind. Hmm? When the majoritarian push came in in Sri Lanka, and Tamil minority was uh, was targeted by the Sinhala majority parties. And when that majoritarian push emerged in Malaysia against especially the Chinese, two things happened. In Sri Lanka, the Tamils did not accept their secondary status. And within within 20 years of that majoritarian push, the conditions for a civil war emerged. In, Ch- in Malaysia, the Chinese accepted their secondary status. And therefore, after nine, the great uh, violence of riots of 1969, just outside Kuala Lumpur, just outside the capital city, and in some major cities of Malaysia, um, the civil war was averted because the Chinese, for a whole variety of reasons, accepted their secondary status. If Muslims of India accept their secondary status, the violence will be minimal. If they organize and do not accept their secondary status, the big difference between Sri Lanka and India would be that in the Tamil minority of Sri Lanka was geographically concentrated up in the north. India's Muslims are not concentrated in any particular part of India except Jammu and Kashmir is a different kind of problem, right? It was not a lot of... uh, Indian Muslims would not look at Kashmiri Muslims as necessarily part of their community. They're different kinds of Muslims. That's a very different kind of problem. Hmm. So, so India's Muslim, in any case, Kashmir might be Muslim majority state until two years ago, um, like the Muslim majority geography at this point. But India's, unlike Tamil minority, India's Muslim minority is not geographically concentrated. So, if they don't accept their secondary status, what kind of political strategy they'll come up with remains unclear. My sense is they will try to go with parties which include them in their political political strategy to counter the BJP. Repeatedly, more than 8% of BJ, uh, Muslims have... Repeatedly, BJP gets only 8% Muslim vote. That has repeatedly happened. In UP, in the two UP assembly elections and the two Lok Sabha elections after 2004, in the last two Lok Sabha elections, it's only 8%, right? 
right? So Muslims are not likely to vote for BJP. If they vote in very large numbers for BJP, it means they have accepted their peripherality to in, in Indian society and Indian polity, and they've accepted uh, BJP's claim about uh, Hindu supremacy, and they will be they will they have accepted Hindu supremacy. So it these are the uh, this is how I can as a political scientist and as a as a polit- as a political observer of India as a political scientist of India can answer this question. Uh, there are two of these great examples: Malaysia and Sri Lanka. Both are different from India, but they come closest to this problem. Israel actually doesn't come closest to the problem analytically. Israel is more like Pakistan. Pakistan was formed as a Muslim state, and that comparison has been made. Israel was formed as a Jewish state, where minorities were not given equal status to begin with. But India, we started with religious equality as our cardinal constitutional principle. Ambedkar has very famous arguments about this. Why religious equality and why minority protection is absolutely important. So, in fact, uh, and this is not uh, castles in the air or hopeful thinking or something, but two points come back to us over and over again. One, the constitution has acted as a kind of bulwark, which so far has stayed the course. And uh, right. till it is fundamentally changed, and that also will take time, it remains a solid foundation on which people put their faith in. Now, we are seeing it's flouting not just by the executive or by the political system, by the establishment, but also by sections of the judiciary sometimes. The media, of course, is a sorry situation. I don't have to tell you. So the media, in fact, is a, is a force multiplier as far as the BJP is concerned, the embedded media. So, so far, the constitution is held true. If that changes, all bets are off. So, then your prognosis assumes even more importance because then they will see which way uh, lies their security and all that. So, I think, uh, I think, uh, I mean, it's best that we do not start getting uh, moony-eyed about what's happening in the country and how it will uh, stay strong, but uh, understand some of the implications. My own sense is, and this is a completely pragmatic view, is a realistic view that it's going to take a lot of push because to change the constitution also, you need certain building blocks in place. And uh, we don't know whether the building blocks are there. Just waving them aside is this time not going to be as easy as it was in 1975 and 76. So we don't know how it's going to fall. I think all predictions, uh, theoretical framework is perhaps the best way to look at it. But uh, all predictions must wait for some time. So you sound uh, grim. And a little, uh, um, I would say, uh, serious. And I won't say pessimistic, but you sound grim. And uh, But you've given the lay of the land and all that. So shall we look at India with some, you know, for 70 years, India, the beacon of democracy, the largest democracy in the world. Shall we continue looking at it as something that will see its way through? So the two largest international democracy assessment bodies, Freedom House and and VDEM Institute in Sweden, both have degraded India's status from democracy to either a semi-democracy or VDEM's case, I think slightly, that's slightly, that's that's conceptually wrong, electoral uh, autocracy. What's happening is that India's electoral democracy is coming into an alarming conflict with India's constitutional democracy, the larger concept of democracy, right? A democracy is not defined by elections alone. It is also defined by what happens between elections, those five years. How does the government conduct itself? And whether it, it, it follows the constitutional norms. So to call India today a vibrant democracy would be conceptually incorrect. India is a vibrant electoral democracy 
but an increasingly weakening constitutional democracy. Or you can call it increasingly weakening liberal democracy. You can call it that. Because the notion of liberal democracy is partly reliant on elections as the basis of government formation. But the other part is freedom of expression, freedom of religious practice, freedom of association. The BJP is opposed to civil society organizations and has cracked down heavily, except a civil society organization called the RSS or Hindu Yuva Vahini. That's a civil society organization too. But that is that hasn't received, that has been the object of anger or object of uh, coercion. But a lot of civil society organizations have been wiped out. So freedom of association has, as a principle has been attacked. Freedom of religious practice as a principle has been attacked. Muslims are feeling extremely endangered hmm? about their the worship, about their headgear, about, uh, about uh, several other practices. Azan, even Azan. And, uh, and freedom of expression also has been attacked. And Mr. Modi actually has, has attacked the very idea of rights. He's now quite a few times said that duties are more important than rights. That is not how a, de a constitutional democracy functions. Constitutional democracy functions on the basis of rights, not on the basis of duties. The so-called duties are part of India's, India's, um, non-justiciable segment of the constitution, right? They call directive principles. Hmm? They are not, so, so India, no democratic constitution has elevates duties over rights. Mr. Modi wrote in the, in the New York Times op-ed that duties are more important than rights and he, as, he ascribed that notion to Mahatma Gandhi. And, but in any case, the RSS texts say that. And he, he said that rights weaken a nation. Duties strengthen a nation. So the attack on fundamental rights, which are without which Indian constitution cannot be defined. The attack on constitutional rights, on fundamental rights, is part of this ideological project. And to, since you mentioned the judiciary, in any democratic system, the fundamental defender of the constitution and of the rights is the judiciary. We know that as part of, of elementary political science. It's the judiciary which is the fundamental protector of citizen rights, of fundamental rights, right, freedom of expression, freedom of religious practice, freedom of association, and the constitution itself. Hmm. So uh, the prediction that we cannot make uh, about which you you spoke so so eloquently a, a few minutes ago, the prediction we cannot make is how the judiciary would finally act in the coming years. That is a prediction that cannot be made. If it follows the electoral logic, if in its interpretation or in its, in its judicial interpretation, it ends up following the electoral logic, India's democracy will completely collapse. It won't even be semi-democracy then. If it fall, if its judicial interpretation is more in accordance with the constitutional spirit, as opposed to the electoral logic of the polity, then India's, India's democracy can still continue. The issue again and again that is appearing now over the last few years is which way will the judiciary go? Elections are going one way. It's not clear 2024 will be very different. It may be, it may not be. But judiciary's role needs to be clearly emphasized now. The judiciary caved in 1975 and 76. It did. It is not only the press that crawled when asked to asked to bend. It's the judiciary that also crawled at that time and called the emergency constitutionally valid. Right. So let's see which way the judiciary goes. The signs are unclear. A lot of judicial scholars are reading India's judicial, uh, 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 the conduct of India's Supreme Court unfavorably now. But I don't think we can close the book on that or we can rule out completely the some element of judicial independence exercised over the coming years. So judiciary also is our, judiciary will have to be factored in when we try and answer your question about is democracy over? Is it going to be over? No, it's judiciary which has become a very important uh, institution now for the furtherance or continuation of Indian democracy. So. Thank you so much, uh, Ashutosh, uh, for giving us a 
the framework to understand what's happening in India. We read about it in the papers all the time. We, we watch television. Some of us do. Many of us don't. But it has a voice, it has an influencer role. Social media is another uh, platform. As you know, WhatsApp is misused, used and misused in India. So we are too close to the canvas. You who have studied India and democracies around the world are taking the broad view, the long view, with a lot of background behind you in terms of what you have read and written, more importantly. So we get an understanding of what's happening in India because similar things have happened elsewhere and uh, what could happen in India. Whether from here or elsewhere, I would say it looks like a fairly grim situation. But many of us who have fundamental faith in the Indian people, such as their strength is at the moment, they, they are feeling also... Uh, disempowered in many ways. But that faith has seen us through in the past. You know, it's politics and all kinds of things happen in politics. So let's see how these things go. In any case, this discussion is something that will continue to be extremely critical and important to understand what's happened in India at this moment and what will happen in the coming year. So thank you very much for participating in the Wire Talks. It was a pleasure. You can check out this podcast and other interesting ones on the Wire website, the IVM podcast website, app, or wherever else that you get your podcasts. Goodbye from me, Siddharth Bhatia, and the Wire Talks podcast team. Hello, hello, hello. It's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On The Habit Coach, author Aparna Piramal Raje shares with Ashton seven mental health therapies. The Simplified Gang discussed the Tata Group's recently released Super App. On A Sip of Finance, Priyanka explains how inflation affects our households. On Tere Mere Raste's 100th episode, Keshav takes us to Amritsar's beautiful Golden Temple. Keshav, congrats for the 100 episodes. Wow, that's... A whole 100 episodes. Check them all out. And on Smarter with Sid, Siddharth sheds light on why Netflix lost over 200,000 subscribers in the first quarter of 2022. Do follow us on social media. We are IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, do tell a friend. It really helps us out a lot. Also, don't forget to rate us on any platforms you're listening on and you can also check us out on YouTube. We are also doing a small listener survey to better understand how you respond to our shows and advertising on the network. We would really appreciate it if you could spare a few minutes to fill it. It helps us build better shows for you. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week, SBI Life Insurance, India Water Portal and Jupiter, a digital banking app. Are you looking for finance products and services that can enhance your personal finance experience? Are you looking for a space to talk about your financial product or service? And are you looking for a crisp talk show where the conversation is all about money? Well, your search ends here. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta and I'm host of the Pesa Pesa podcast. And I invite you for the conversation about your personal finance on each Monday on the IBM podcast app or the website or on any podcast streaming platforms. See you folks.